All right, we're recording. Uh, welcome back, everybody. This is Shane Gibson with Racken, and welcome to version 21 of Digital Rebar Provision Meetup. It's been a solid month since we met last. Uh, our last meetup, uh, scheduled meetup, fell on the 3rd of July, and we chose to bump that one out uh, since the 4th of July is a relatively big holiday in the United States. Uh, so welcome back to everybody. We have online with us today uh, from Racken. We have Rob Hirschfeld, our CEO and uh, co-founder. Uh, myself, Shane Gibson, I do stuff, and our amazing marketing stud, Steven Spector. And we have a fairly decent contingent of folks from the community. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming and attending. Uh, for this meetup, we're going to talk a bit more about our favorite topic, Kubernetes and highly available patterns that have been developing and evolving within the crib tool. Crib is the Kubernetes rebar immutable bootstrap tool. And we're also going to talk about docs or document all of the things since uh, we like doing uh, crazy acronyms, documenting all the things is that and that that good thing to talk about. <laughs> Okay, that was bad. I know, I know. I, I apologize. I'll, I'll refrain from really yeah. bad puns. <laughs> and uh, we'll also talk about the V390 uh, release, which finally came out. We've been talking about 390 for a long time. I think a good solid month between uh, initial planning and release. Uh, we released 390 officially, must have been, what, three weeks ago, I, I guess, Rob, if you recall. Um, it's it, it feels like a long time. There's we got oh the RBAC stuff. Yeah, I had to bake. Um, yeah, a, we had a lot a of big features drop. So this 25 release. days ago was when the release notes were cut. So uh, a little over three weeks ago, we released 390, and we'll talk about some of the the things that dropped into 390, uh, and then we'll turn things over to Rob to do a crib HA demo or talk about crib HA demo depending on how the demo gods treat us today. Um, but for now, let's go ahead and jump straight into 390. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen, we do, um, we being uh, the Royal, in this case, it's almost always Greg. Greg does an amazing job uh, of putting together release notes of all of the features, enhancements, fixes, and goodness and in, baked into each of the products. And you can find those when you go to the GitHub uh, repo uh, you click on the releases uh, link and then we'll have, so we have a current rolling tip pro, uh, version with all the different commits against tip. So as you can see, we have a number of things checked into Git, but what we're after is the 390 release notes. So 390, some of the main things that we hit on uh, were role-based access controls, which we had talked about a couple times in some of the meetups uh, as the, the feature was coalescing, and a lot of this is the, the heavy lifting of this work was done uh, by Victor, who put together a lot of the RBAC capabilities that allows you to define roles and, and rights for each of those roles uh, for folks to uh, start moving towards tenancy, multi-tenancy, or more uh, secure-based models where you want to be able to do API uh, controls and then lock down specifically what features or capabilities given APIs calls or actors can make at a given time. Uh, we also added secure parameters, another piece that was a lot of heavy lifting by Victor. Uh, secure parameters allow us to create encrypted uh, values within the parameter field and obfuscate those from view and access. Um, and to limit in a conjunction with our back who can or can't see the actual values of params. So this allows you to create uh, secrets that can be used within content packs that allow you to uh, prevent those actual secrets from being exposed. Uh, future work will also include, um, most likely include, I should say, uh, the ability to be able to use external um, store HSM systems to be able to store credentials in. Uh, right now, however, um, the secure params feature is focused on storing those uh, param objects on the DRP endpoint directly itself. So we haven't yet done any of the work to do external uh, HSM or secret stores uh, like uh, HashiCore's vault is an example of something that we might look at, at 
integrating with to allow Vault to provide the secret stores. Uh, simple HA in DRP. So uh, this is a lot of work that Greg is doing that allows uh, for uh, using console as a key value store for backends. Uh, it also allows a little bit of uh, failover capability of virtual IP. Um, as the title states, simple HA, uh, it hasn't been fully baked yet and it still needs a lot of love, but it's the beginnings of making digital rebar provision itself highly, highly available. Uh, there's a couple other patterns that will be emerging too that we'll be applying, uh, which allows things like multi-sync uh, between multiple DRP endpoints where you can essentially have um, a star topology, a master DRP, which syncs uh, configuration and state information out to other DRP uh, instances. Um, and all of those things uh, lead towards uh, much more enterprise usage of uh, monolithic or um, much more set uh, provisioning infrastructure. So a lot of uh, our customers bring up uh, uh, either a container, we'll slap some configuration in, do some provisioning, throw away the container, or similarly uh, sort of environment with uh, scripting or API calls, CLI or API calls to bring up a DRP instance, do some work, and then throw it away. If you're operating in an environment where you have uh, much more monolithic or long-lived instances, you care about those things a little bit more and high availability of them is um, important. Also, as you scale uh, from a performance perspective, you need multiple DRP endpoints to handle multiple environments or heavy load with thousands of machines being provisioned at once. Uh, so all of these HA features will lead towards those higher, um, higher scale, uh, higher end use case capabilities. Um, those are the sort of the big things, uh, but as we can see from our list beyond the big things, we have a number of uh, uh, additions and enhancements that uh, have come into play also. One of the, the big ones is the search plugin. Uh, the search plugin allows uh, digital rebar provision to generate uh, SSL uh, TLS certificates and manage those certs as a CA. And so there was some work done with DRP CLI to do that. And that is in fact used relatively heavily uh, with the uh, Kubernetes crib components to be able to do HA uh, with the etcd and the certificate management to be able to support the HA patterns necessary for that. Uh, PowerShell, uh, we've done some work with uh, enabling commands in Windows environments to operate correctly using PowerShell. Uh, to implement those commands and when provisioning uh, Windows-based machines. Um, I'm sorry to all of you stuck doing that, but if you're stuck doing that, well, hopefully we've helped to make your life a lot better uh, so we can uh, support PowerShell through DRP CLI. Uh, Please. Pardon? It was a huge release. A lot of. Lot it's a huge release. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's it's why it took took us two months to uh, define, test, bake, and and release all of this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, training lab setup scripts for recent changes. I'm not sure what Greg means by that. Which one? Update training lab setup scripts for recent changes. So this comes from our, um, the, so he, we actually put a lot of work into this. Uh, you remember the lab we did for um, ITX Interop? Yes. This was, this was all the work to build uh, the labs for ITX Interop. Okay, yes, yes, yes. Um, and then uh, we added a lot of network card information into the GoHigh uh, output. So GoHigh has grown a lot more information uh, that it's able to produce through JSON. Uh, we also have, um, for those of you who may have missed it, we have an inventory module that um, our glorious and esteemed CEO, Rob, on the, the call here was responsible for birthing and managing and maintaining. Uh, the inventory module has also expanded, which allows you to be able to uh, basically index across different uh, JSON uh, blobs, so to speak. So in, the, in this case, Go High Inventory is a JSON blob. If you're working with some of our um, more uh, downstack integration pieces, uh, RAID and um, uh, firmware uh, BIOS related stuff, all of the information that comes out of those um, uh, plugins in DRP produces JSON. 
And if you want to be able to uh, iterate or provide a, a simplified inventory view over the top of those, the inventory uh, content pack lets you do that. And it's a lot e lighter weight, easier to manipulate than the thousands upon thousands of lines of JSON that gets regurgitated from some some of the larger I might, modules. I might be able to demo that. I, I did a video of it. I'm, I keep meaning to do a cleaner video of it, but um, it's integrated into the UX even too. So if you the inventory UX uh, extra fields in machine view uses the inventory data now instead of the instead of trying to figure it out itself, which is the right. user settable. Exactly. So it's a really nice piece uh, along with a, another pattern we have evolving, which is classification. Uh, that's something that a lot of customers have asked for, and we've been working on. Uh, we haven't fully abstracted yet from one of our customer implementations, but I think that'll be coming pretty soon, is a module that lets you uh, flexibly define classification elements and things to do or actions to perform when a machine meets a given classification. So a simple example of that is if this machine has a given MAC address, uh, kick the machine into a specific workflow. So you can do things like uh, identify, target, and uh, react to your infrastructure dynamically based on uh, information coming from the machines that come up within your infrastructure. Uh, so that'll be an interesting thing that hopefully we'll be demonstrating here uh, maybe in the next uh, one or two uh, meetups. Uh, our back support, we talked a little bit generically about our back support. Um, a lot of the, the capabilities and, and components that were in there, uh, we spoke about in the previous two uh, meetups. Uh, that would be version 18 and 19 uh, meetups. We talked about the RBAC capabilities and components there. Uh, if there's interest in some more detailed uh, information around that, please talk to us and we'll put together another meetup with some more detailed info about the RBAC capabilities. Uh, that's a really uh, very useful tool as uh, organizations start to grow and incorporate uh, other groups and departments and divisions within their company and within the provisioning activities. Uh, it's a very important component. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about doc updates. That's the document all of the things. So we have uh, integrated docs in content packs, uh, which allow us to dynamically generate uh, the content. Um, talk about the documentation I mean from the content. We'll talk about that a little bit. And uh, oh yes, and Chris wants to talk about UX hooks. <laughs> yes, we we have a lot of lot to talk about there, Chris. Um, uh, we add oh, so I added the upgrade option. So when you're doing an install in the past, you had to iterate or you had to specify a, a lot of command line flags, install, force, and up update. Um, we're all flags to the install uh, option of the installer. Um, I added upgrade, which does all of those things for you and tries to be a little bit smarter on how it does upgrades to an existing instance. So just a minor little usability feature for uh, quick updates. Lots of facts, frequently asked questions, updates. Uh, what else? Machines helper for the workflow field, API to send GZIP data. These are all good things. List operations to send slim objects. Ah, yeah, slim objects is actually a pretty important uh, component. So um, referring back to my statements I just made a few minutes ago about great big huge JSON blobs, uh, at first it doesn't seem like it should be that big a deal. You have a go high inventory blob, it's got a bunch of stuff on it, and yeah, it's kind of annoying to scroll through or look through the JSON, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're running uh, large estates with hundreds, if not thousands of machines, all of that go high inventory uh, ends up becoming uh, dozens to hundreds of megabyte of data that streams back when you make uh, calls. And so that was causing a tremendous amount of grief for some of our customers with large number of machines. Uh, so slim objects is well, uh, Rob, why don't you talk about Slim? This is one of the things you worked, worked with quite extensively. Yeah, because uh, we had in integrated it into the UX almost immediately, um, which is a big performance helper. So um, yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, there's two places that we have very little control <laughs> over what people stuff into models, which is parameters and, and uh, metadata. They're designed to be open-ended. Um, and so 
there's a lot of places where you know those those two fields in the models for machines, for plugins, and for profiles get get very big. Uh, and so what Slim does is it gives you an option to not retrieve that, not have it you know, basically inflated when you retrieve mo models from the API. The, the data is still there, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky. The, 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 the field is still there, it's just empty. So you have to know that you retrieved uh, things with Slim, Slim and then ask if you need the parameters, you have to then ask for them. So the UX was modified in 3.9. Um, and there's a flag for this. So it, it detects whether your endpoint supports slim or not. If it does support slim, it's going to use the slim field. Um, everything we do is as flags um, that, that key off these, these features. And then, so literally every time you look at, say, the machine's view, it's not pulling back the full machine object. And then when you flip to a machine view, it, uh, the machine's a machine view, as opposed to the list, it actually pulls the parameters live at that moment. Um, and so you only pull in that data when you're actually looking at a screen that needs it. Um, and we made that change in all the appropriate places. It, it's, it made a nice difference, even in small UX environments. Um, and there, there isn't any, so uh, I'm watching uh, Chris in the, in the background. There's no nested objects um, in digital rebar. So it's, it's basically, and I guess nested, if you want to think about parameters, it's nested, but the data for the parameters is actually in the object. So um, it's taking those places that have open-ended values and letting, the, letting you not get them pulled back. Um, the data, the data is still exactly where it was. This is really just a U, U, API flag to change the API rendering behavior as an optimization. Um, so that was, does that, does that sort of explain it? It's, it's really just a UI, an API, sorry, an API optimization and then the UX picked it up. Sounds like it says okay. We'll assume okay means okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it's in the docs, so the docs actually describe how to how to do this. Um, uh, I definitely, I definitely, as I was coding it in the UX, I, I wrote it into the docs, so it's there. Just search for Slim. Excellent. Um, moving on uh, from enhancements and new features, uh, some of the bugs that got fixed. There are a couple of sort of important ones. Uh, this again goes to performance uh, related issues. When you had lots and lots of machines uh, sending job logs back to a DRP endpoint, that would cause a huge amount of congestion and, well, for lack of a better term, hiccups and burps on the DRP endpoint side uh, as it was trying to pull in all of the job logs. So there was a number of um, buffering activities added to reduce that load on the DRP endpoint and uh, increase the parallelism and, and uh, ability for DRP to tr handle multiple job log transactions. So currently the defaults are uh, when job logs are sent back, uh, every it's sent back in 64K byte chunks or every one second, whichever happens first. So if you have uh, log streaming back from provisioning activities within your workflow, you'll get uh, those one second sort of pauses as it waits for either more buffered log info to come in uh, so you don't get quite the instantaneous uh, job log streaming which is disappointing but it's totally understandable we don't want to kill drp performance just to get that log that quick um, index lookups were fixed um, what else some a couple of race conditions were fixed as well um, some code linting was done uh, some more logging, content action events. Console backend data store was updated and fixed to support the newer version of DRP. All good things. So that's an awful lot, like we were saying, <laughs> packed into one feature. So it took us a long time to um, finalize, uh, stabilize, and bake it long enough that we're comfortable releasing 3.9.0. So yay to the team, 25 days ago, we released 3.9.0. Um, very exciting, uh, and as you saw from the previous uh, commit logs, we have a lot going back into what will probably become 391. Uh, I don't think we'll, I'm not sure if we'll cut 310 depending on uh, enhancements and features, probably not. I believe these are mostly all uh, fixes and, and enhancements to existing 
and not a whole lot of new stuff at this point. All right, that's an awful lot. Um, Let's, um, uh, Rob, do you want to do, are you ready for a demo? Do you, are things happy on your side? Or do you want me to eat up a little more time with no, no, the don't, don't eat up any more time. <laughs> okay. I'm fine to, I mean, the demo might, might, I might be showing how it, it, it doesn't complete, but that's fine. I, that's, that's perfectly fine. All right. I'm going to take. This All right. Screen. So we'll, we'll turn things over to Rob for uh, more HA stuff. And I'm gonna I'm gonna actually gonna start with some of the docs pieces too that we uh, I was just looking for the um, for the place where we put the docs uh, cross reference table of contents and then uh, content packages which I have on the screen right now. Okay, there you go. Yeah, I'm gonna show people how this is built. Um, but uh, I can explain what I it while you're talking. showing it because I I have the I have the same screen. <laughs> you want to give me control and I'll talk and show you. Or just stop sharing and I'll take over. All yours. Got it. Here we come. All right. Can you see my my uh, window? Yep. Same window that you're showing. Um, so as we keep building content packs, the need to have them included in the documentation um, and have documentation for it is pretty important. But we don't want people to have to check in changes, say, to the crib documentation in order for you to get so if, if you look so here's crib and the crib documentation here's it's ver oh wow look it's even down to its version um, and this shows you all it, all the parameters that are in it all the stages that are in it and there's a whole bunch of documentation explaining how things work and I'll show you what where that comes from but we're building the documentation for crib inside of the crib content bundles that way it encourages really good behavior as people build the capabilities or fix things. You, you actually get all of it automatically. And then you're not expected to go into provision, read the docs. Um, let's go to the top and try and do commits. So all this is code in, in the provision repo. And so what we didn't want to have happening more, if you look at crib, there's a crib documentation section inside of uh, the main docs. And so what we'd rather do is move this information into the components so it's versioned and managed and kept up with from a, a component perspective rather than writing inside a digital rebar uh, proper. And to do that, what we've, one of the changes that, that made it into 3.9 and will be ignored if you have an older version, is that all of the models have a documentation section here that takes RST. Hey, Rob? Yep. Can you make your uh, screen a bit bigger? Or the you got it. It's pretty small in the share. There you go, thank uh, you. That's too big, probably. All right, how's that? Better, thank you. So in this case, if you see in the YAML, there's a documentation block. This is actually RST. And when you build a, uh, a content pack, um, it will literally take all of the documentation and create an RST bundle and then add it, um, our build process adds it into the documentation set that is created for digital rebar. Um, and so we have a process that allows us to include that. One of the things that is just been added, um, and so I need to start incorporating, is there's going to be a underscore uh, documentation.meta that so the home page like that that this page that I showed you will actually get moved over into documentation.meta and it would be the home page for the um, uh, for the for the Kubernetes master I'm looking at Robert's uh, checks I'm wondering if that's part of my nope that's not it's causing me issues um, so that's that's going to be consistent across the board. And uh, we as a team have been working even ahead of that change to get more and more documentation metadata into everything we built. So if you look, it's one of the first things I was doing when uh, I started playing with Cribmore is, of course, I pick one that's not actually, a, uh, it, yeah, I should document what those stages go. But if I looked at, started with parameters, and so parameters all have some documentation that explains what they do. Um, we're also pretty consistent about uh, colors and icons. And then we've been actually making metadata even smarter 
Ooh, there's a lot of little things that are um, in behind the scenes. Like cluster masters actually have a rendering instruction that, that gives you a machines list. Pretty fun. I'll show you that. It's part of it. So that's that's a big, we're trying to improve documentation as we go on things and you'll see that um, for all these pieces and parts. Cool. That helpful for that? Yep, absolutely. Thank you. And let me see something. I, well, I, I would also point out, uh, you, you briefly touched on, uh, we haven't been using uh, very effectively yet, but all of that documentation stuff will follow REST uh, RST uh, convention, so they, we can start injecting a lot more rich information into the documentation in just um, But that's still new and, and we're still, you'll also find that a lot of our content packs haven't yet been fully fleshed out with documentation from that, but that's a ongoing journey for us as we maintain those, we'll start adding more documentation into the various uh, con content packs. And, and Greg was working inside of the UX um, he was adding a RST renderer so that we'll actually be able to pull that documentation live into all the documentation pieces. So if you had a stage uh, or anything, right right now, it, the, we don't show the documentation at all. It's a, it's a hidden it's a hidden field. Um, uh, let me do something that has actually has documentation. Uh, etcd name. Something like that. It's hidden, but it's actually in the schema. And so we'll start rendering those things. Um, we can't render them well because of the RST. Yes, we need an RST renderer. All right. So uh, Kubernetes, are we going to talk? Oh, I can also talk about the inventory stage briefly if, if there's interest in that. Um, well, we've got uh, 25 minutes left, so what do you need for Kubernetes? Why don't we do the Kubernetes stuff, and if we have time left over, we'll kick into a um, bonus round. Okay, so I, I have a Kubernetes cluster here that I started and it failed. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear, I need to clear out this uh, cluster and reset it, so I want to show how that works. Because if, if you're right now, so let me, let me be very clear. Crib and Crib HA merge together. There is, no only, there is now only Crib. Um, I'm not going to make the joke be about Zool because that would mean an OpenStack joke, and I'm not going to make it. Um, so there's, there's, only, there's only Crib, which would be v3 if you want to think about it that way. Um, and it's still development. This is all open source. You're welcome to make patches and changes and play with it. We have some videos. I'm going to I'm going to do more videos about it, um, including Terraform, which I'll save some time for. Um, but in a development process, that means you're going to run it and it's going to break, and you're going to run it and it's going to break. And the thing about the cluster, is you have to be able to reset the fields in between those runs. And because of the HA um, cluster uses the cert integrations. Actually, it's all HA, even if you're just running a single master because we generate certs for you. And machines cannot manage their own certs. They can ask for certs, but they can't delete them. And so part of this process means that you have to externally reset the system. Um, Shane had um, some built-in behavior that would automatically do resets with a flag. I added a stage for that. Uh, so there's a, a workflow stage that uh, you, you'll get in the latest stuff that does a crib reset. So instead of building it into the installs, I created reset as its own thing. Shane, you and I never hand, for you were out or I didn't talk to you about it, but it, it we've, we've, we've all been a little busy lately. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, we've been swamped. Um, anyway, so if, if I want to take a, a system that I've reset, all I need to do is go through and do a crib reset on it and run that stage. And you could add this into the beginning of your, your crib live, your, your crib live deploy. Um, if you're doing that sort of uh, dev pattern of test, iterate, test, iterate, adding that reset pattern up front is good to wipe, but it's important to also be aware of that because of production clusters, you don't want to reset and accidentally rebuild a cluster, so. Right, and so one of the things that you'll see here, is all these machines are off, so I have to, I have to turn, make them runnable. Um, and this is the latest UI stuff, so there's some, some little 
little things I've been adding to improve the debug uh, process workflow. So in this case, it failed, which is what I expected. Um, and what it's doing is it's saying, hey, you, you know, I'm clearing all this stuff and it's saying, oh, wait a second, you have to delete the root certificate. So I'm just gonna cut and paste this. I know you can't see it, but I'm gonna paste this into a window um, where it's gonna run those commands and tell me success. Um, I'm not, I don't wanna switch back and forth you, uh, through Zoom right now, but this, this delete route can't be done inside of the, from the machines, that's a security violation. So you have to do it from your command line with, with access. And then uh, from here, one of the little niceties is, that I've added in is you can do things like turn on debug, um, which will get a lot more logging. Um, you can't turn it off <laughs> from this view, but you can turn it on. Um, it'll also show you the icon and the name of the machine and not just its, its UX. But if I set the machine runnable here, it's gonna restart the process. Now this job is already done, so I'm not gonna get back to that job but I can go in and refresh here and you'll actually see all the completed jobs after that. So I was bouncing back and forth. I've been trying to reduce my bouncy times. Um, so here's curb reset cluster is now in a finished state and it's the cluster has been reset. Um, so that would mean for these, for these machines, what I wanna do is I'm gonna actually gonna take them out of the crib cluster profile. Um, and I'm just gonna let them reset back to discover. And then because of the, we've, we've messed with them, we have to reboot them to let them go back through a power cycle. Uh, I did bring, bring up four new machines that we'll play with and we'll put those into the crib cluster. So it's pretty straightforward. I'm gonna add them into the crib cluster and now I should be ready to build it. Before I do that, I'm gonna show you how to check to make sure things are cleared out. So here's the crib profile that we're using to work, work in cluster. I got that just by taking the example cluster and cloning it. And then it has the crib name in the etcd profile and cluster profile. We are building a ton of workflows that use this, this cluster building pattern. So they say the parameter with the name of the profile and then that creates a cluster. So um, the machines see this and then know where to store their shared data. Um, that's the one requirement. You'll see this pattern in a lot of different um, digital rebar uh, patterns that we have. Um, cool. And then this one actually has a render instruction called crib that throws in um, some additional flagging at the top of this profile. So let me go ahead and start it. So, it is, so now that they're in the profile, I can go in and I can just tell them to start the crib live cluster. This does the in-memory boot pattern and it's gonna go start the process. Wow, this machine is a lot faster. So I use the, um, a bigger packet machine here and they are significantly faster than the little uh, tinies um, that we have going and the tinies are rebooting in the background. You can actually see them doing their thing. Um, another thing that's new with the UX, if you haven't, if you haven't played with the UX lately, um, I think this made it in the 3.9 version, is uh, as long as you're not refreshing, it's gonna take status cache and it's gonna do things like tell you the shops failed and show you um, some events and actions about what, what happened and what went wrong as you go. And so as you navigate in around on these things, you're going to get some bonus behavior um, like these extra buttons and names and things like that. Um, just mostly little usability tweaks. But that's that's Crib going through and doing its install. What you'll notice is we changed the icons so you can see that it selected a leader. Um, and it's going through and build it, doing the work to uh, figure out what's going on. This pulls latest so as Kubernetes makes changes, sometimes it breaks us because um, we're just using kubeadmin uh, tip. And so it's, it's electing. You'll notice that what I, what I actually did was I picked, I intentionally picked the big two. This anchor means that it's the master of the cluster. Uh, and so it's got to do some work before the other machines go. If I look at the profile for crib, You'll see I've built, I've got all this data being populated as I go, and this is what I was talking about for um, oops, that dynamically updates. Um, so the list of servers is a is a hash map, 
it's an array with an object in it. But if you close it, it'll actually show you all the machines in that list, and now you can navigate um, directly to it. So it'll, it'll bounce over, take you to that machine. Like that. Uh, there we go. This will take me back to the job. And so now it's literally just waiting for it to bring up the, uh, oh, there's finished. So this, this just built the cluster admin config, which looks really good. So the bigger machines are working, Shane. So it's, it's telling me, yeah, these are all, these are the three other machines are now done. The main machine has additional work that we wait on. So it keeps going, building the control, the control plane and the cluster is actually live. And this is really fun. So if I go into profiles, I go into crib. Now that the cluster is done, it actually gives me the hint. I want to run kube cuddle uh, using kube config admin conf. And if I click on this button, it's going to download the admin conf to my local machine. And I can just run it when I have, I have kube, kube cuddle control done. It will literally, running that exact command with that file will attach me to this Kubernetes cluster. So there, there you go, Shane. The demo worked. I think those. I think the tinies are not happy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I bumped up the size, and everything's a little bit, a little bit more responsive. Um, yep. And I, this need, this should probably be obfuscated too. I'll fix that. Um, oh, one of the other little tweaks we did is that you can actually now edit things raw. Uh, there's there's tons. We keep making little tiny adjustments, not so many big things in the UX lately, but a lot of little usability tweaks. Um, and then when I'm, when I'm done, you can only build, um, I think you can only build one cert, one, one machine at a time because of the cert naming issues. Um, and so I just go through the reset process I showed you to tear them down. Uh, I've got a couple of recalcitrant tinies that aren't going through the full process. So I don't know. It's probable um, it's network latency issues on the um, provider side. Could be, yep. Um, boy, so I covered documentation in crib. Let me show you where the crib code is. Yep, right here. So if you want uh, to play around with crib, um, we build it and compile it. So you can just install the crib content pack. Actually, I'll show you that. Um, there's my backup machine. So you can go into the content packs and uh, you need crib. And if, if you want to play, you're going to want tip or you're going to want to build your own. And I have a video where I showed you how to do that. So I'm not going to take the time here to you, you get, you clone, you bundle, and then you upload the, the bundle. So this is actually my uploaded bundle um, compared to what's in community right now. Um, and you also need the certs plugin. Um, this hasn't been changing much, but uh, I, would, I would switch it to tip. And we're going to be moving. We're a little swamped right now for, for fixing things that are nice to have. Um, but certs, packet IPMI, virtual box IPMI, um, those are definitely going to move into Apache license community and possibly some other interesting things. I don't, we, we're still discussing what moves over and what doesn't, but those three will definitely move over. Um, cool. And then I can show really briefly how to do what the inventory thing looks like, Shane, if we want. Uh, yeah, we've got um, a few more minutes left. So if you want to go ahead and kick into that. Okay. So, um, Inventory, the inventory state, inventory is part of the uh, task library. And I'm using the tip task library because we made a change for the one nine. We made a change after one nine came out. Um, they're backwards compatible, or at least it'll, it'll tell you if when it's, it'll tell you how to fix it if uh, you switch. But all I need to do to make the inventory work is drop in the inventory stage. Here it is. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to, I'm just putting it in the node discover. Um, and what inventory is going to do is it's going to add in, it's going to look at go high data 
on the machine. So if I was, was over here, oh, sorry. If I was over here, say on crib four, let me look at the machine first. You'll see I have go high. If you've ever looked at go high, you'll be scared. Um, and what I really would like to do is just pull a, a little bit of data out of go high and make it easier to use. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to run, I keep going back to machines. Um, I'm going to run, uh, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to clear the workflow. Good. And then I'm going to go ahead and start discover. And I got to make it, oops. I did set it. Oh, it's just not refreshing. All right, so uh, it's failing on the go high stage. This, so I've been seeing this. Um, I'm not sure why. So if you see this uh, go high failure, you've seen it too or not? Yeah, I saw it once before. Um, I've, I've I thought been it was... seeing it consistently on some of these packet machines. Uh, uh, it's happening elsewhere too. I thought I'd killed that bug, but apparently it has resurrected itself. Um, so to fix it, I just removed, um, Rob, are you on 390, uh, stable or on tip? I'm on, so 390, you're on tip 23. 23. No, I'm not okay. that it, there's, yeah, but so it's a couple weeks old. Um, anyway, so I, I just ran, um, this thing through once I removed the go high data, it fixed it. Um, and now if I go back to that machine, what you'll see is I actually have inventory data. Yay, and the inventory data, oh, Greg added some fields, cool. Um, the inventory data then includes um, a flat list of things that I was interested in. I'll show you how we got there. Um, but so now if I care about these things from inventory, then I've got, you know, I don't have to fight through go high, I can just look at the simpler list. And this is really cool, that populates uh, fields here. So if you run inventory on machines, you can actually edit your user fields, your, your user profile, um, your digital rebar user profile, and tell it what fields you want to see here. Um, and if the data is there, it'll show you. So in this case, <laughs> this data, we, we got RAM, NIC, CPUs for that one machine. It's the only place it ran. Nobody else had, has that data. So you can control what things you see in the UX now sort of cool like that. If I want to fix that and change it, there's a parameter uh, all cleverly called inventory. Uh, Robert was asking in the community why we did these slashes. Uh, they help us group things. That's the simple answer. Um, but what happens here is I can actually come in and say what data I want to collect. And in this case, uh, it's showing you the defaults. So this is saying run for go high. I want to collect from go high. And then we're just using JQ to filter out the data. So you can take your own version of this, um, populate the inventory collect with this data and uh, set your own values. And then it's set up so that if you want to collect other JSON data, you can add a different command. So if you're using our, um, BIOS detector, it, which also emits JSON, you could do use the same pattern for that. Or if you have any any JSON um, emitting command, the system will then check it. And then it gets even more fun because you can go into inventory uh, check and you can put regexes in to make sure that those fields conform to uh, valid values. And then uh, if you check integrity, it, this will actually, if you turn it to true, it'll it'll stop the code, the stop it'll stop that stage, if the current inventory doesn't match the new inventory. So if somebody say pulled a dim out or something cha else changed in your machine that you were checking, uh, if you ship the machines, this would let you you know compare number of dims, number of nicks, something like that. Um, and then there's and a that, logical and that step. goes back. Yeah, that goes Go back to a lot of the questions a lot of customers have had 
about validation of SKU. So if you have a given set of machines, you buy a thousand machines with a given SKU configuration, you bring them all up, you want to validate that they have the memory, CPU, NICs, drives, etc. A lot of this is driving those patterns and behaviors to let you very quickly identify machines that have a problem with them in terms of what you expect the, the SKU configuration or the hardware configuration to be. So, so it keeps people from having to write a script that searches uh, go high or some other thing to figure out if the machines are good or bad. And then it sends it back. And so if there's a change, I think I made these fields read only so I can't, whoops, I can't, I can't mess with it. Um, yeah, inventory is read only. Uh, I'd have to go to the API or the CLI and actually tweak these. But if I check this, then the integrity check will fail. Um, there's a video. I have a video where I take people through all this stuff um, in a lot more detail. And then there is there is some work uh, that we can talk about probably in the future about a classifier that then makes decisions based on that data. That's a whole other topic. Very common request, but a whole other topic. Uh, cool. So that's Kubernetes documentation. Oh, Terraform. Do I have five minutes or do you want to go somewhere else? You got five minutes. Uh... All right. So in provision content, uh, you'll see there's an integrations directory. And uh, if you want to take what I just did and just automate it so that you could just per, uh, Terraform uh, apply a cluster, um, this, what, I, what I've been trying to do is create a sort of a reference Terraform plugin. And so unlike the past ones we've had, this one actually starts using variables, pull things out. Um, and so everything's referenced in a way that you can drive it at much more externally. You don't have to modify the plan to change its behavior. So in this case, it will literally build its own profile, create its own workflow. And then it does something really cool. It'll build machines in packet. So it creates raw machines in packet that have certain characteristics. So this will literally create bare metal machines. You can, we have a whole bunch of settings that let you control packets API. You can choose the location and the size and all sorts of stuff. Um, so this will bring up machines in packet and then immediately use the normal Terraform behavior to pull those into a cluster. Uh, so Terraform managed and allocated, set correctly in that bring up, and then uh, then we'll actually per use the Terraform machine to do the to do the next provisioning. The reason we do that is because this doesn't have any um, any weight. It's just build a machine object. DRP machine actually will wait until the machines finish their workflow, uh, and so from that perspective this combination allows you to have a really um, handy thing. And then using Terraform dependencies, you can actually make sure everything's built in the right order. Um, and this I haven't finished. This will actually tell you how to pull down admin conf, which is handy too. Uh, and then if you destroy, it'll unroll all these, all these resources and set the cluster back. Uh, so you could run, but literally that's why it creates its own plans and profiles. I didn't want to assume they were there and, and workflows. Um, so this is, this is in there. Patches of course are welcome. Um, I'm you know, trying to use this as a way I can terraform Kubernetes, run the whole system, watch it go in digital rebar, and then destroy the cluster um, at the end of it, same way. There you go. That was terraform in three minutes. All right, excellent. Thank you, Rob, for the quick spin through. Uh, that is, for the most part, a wrap uh, for Digital Rebar Provision Meetup number 20. Uh, we'll be back again in two weeks, uh, which makes us July 31st. Uh, look forward to seeing you then. We don't have our meetup schedule set yet, but we'll have that out uh, in a short bit. If any of you out there in uh, meetup land have any thoughts or interests on what you'd like to see. We're always interested in what you're hankering to hear about. Um, that's it. Call that a wrap. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Thanks,